welcome. I know a, a number of you have been here for either one or two of the talks earlier today, so I apologize because you're going to hear me say exactly the same thing as before. Uh, my name is John Mogul. I am Associate Director here at the Wolfsonian. Um, and I welcome you all. Uh, we're delighted once again to be collaborating with the Miami Design Preservation League on the Art Deco Weekend Lecture Series. Um, this is the third and final of the talks today. Uh, we had four yesterday and it's been, um, once again, a really successful program. Uh, if you have time and you would like, you're very welcome to visit our galleries after the talk is over. We're open till 6 p.m. Um, you can just go to our box office and ask for a sticker and um, you can get up to the galleries that way. We have an exhibition called Deco uh, Luxury to Mass Market on the seventh floor, very appropriate for this weekend. Um, and I think you'll enjoy that quite a bit. So let me um, turn it over to Jack Johnson, who is the chair of the board of the Miami Design Preservation League, and he will introduce um, our speaker for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, John, and welcome everybody to Art Deco Weekend. I hope you've been enjoying the weekend uh, and uh, everything it has to offer. Um, it will continue until 8 o'clock tonight, so uh, after the lecture, uh, please go over and help yourself to everything we have for you. Um, we, um, uh, we, we are honoring, uh, in this year's Art Deco Weekend, Sheroes, women who made a difference, um, and one of those sheroes was um, the mother, if you will, of the city of Miami Beach, um, Jane Watts Fisher, and so um, uh, another shero, uh, Paula Fletcher, is uh, going to. Be Too bad you weren't popular. <laughs> uh, Paula is going to deliver the lecture for us. Uh, Paula is a retired business executive from the UK, and um, until last year, she was a uh, tour guide for the Miami Design Preservation League, uh, with 10 years uh, of introducing tourists and locals to the Art Deco pastel palaces that surround us in the historic district of Miami Beach. During her time as a guide with the Preservation League, she utilized her um, British accent to uh, charm over 25,000 uh, tourists. Um, she now resides permanently back in the UK, um, much to our detriment, with her two cats, Ella and Allie, who generously allow her occasional visits to her beloved Miami Beach. So please welcome Paula Fletcher. I've got to see if I can get this thing. Can everybody hear me? Is that, yeah. Work? Yeah. Is that right? Yes? Somebody in the back row? Yes? Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, the pictures are not brilliant. I'm going to tell you that straight away. And this is because um, I did try uh, to reach out, as we say, to a number of people. And unfortunately, um, I got no response. And so many of the sites over in America are blocked in the UK for security reasons. And um, is that my phone? No, I don't think so. Um, but anyway, we'll do the best we can. This is my favorite photo of uh, Jane Fisher. December the 6th, 1968, Jane Watts Fisher. Now, she was the widow of Carl Fisher, and she died uh, in New York. She was visiting friends, and she died of a heart attack. She was 83 years old, although her newspapers and the obituary of the time stated that she was 74. <laughs> Only a few months previously, on the 13th of July, she acted as one of the judges of the Miss Universe pageant, which was held at the Miami Beach Auditorium, now known as the Miami Beach Convention Center. 
And this was the year that protests against the Miss America beauty pageant had caused, caused riots in Atlantic City, but all stayed calm in Miami Beach. But who was she? This woman who in the early 1900s captured the heart of one of the wealthiest men in America. And how did she come to meet and marry him? And why did she end up here in Miami Beach? And what made her a household name from round about 1911, 1912 until the day she died? Well, this is what I'm going to try and explore in this lecture. Um, but it's always best to start at the beginning. And in order to talk about Jane Fisher and the contribution that she made to Miami Beach, we first have to set the stage and talk about the man she married, her first husband, the father of Miami Beach, who carved a city out of the jungle, Carl Graham Fisher, my hero. Now, Carl Fisher was born on January the 12th, 1874 in Greensburg, Indiana, which is about 50 miles from Indianapolis. And he was the second of three sons born to Ida and Alfred um, Albert Fisher. And uh, his parents separated when Carl was a very young boy. His father was an alcoholic, and basically provided little to no support um, for Ida and her growing children. So she moved her family um, to Indianapolis, and she took in boarders in order to provide money for, you know, to support herself and the boys. Now, Carl Fisher um, had extremely severe astigmatism, and this left him with only 50% of his vision. And so it meant that while he was at school, he couldn't see the blackboard, he couldn't keep up with the rest of the class, and he dropped out in the sixth grade. Um, Carl also felt that he should be doing more to contribute um, to you know, helping his mother. And uh, this really, by dropping out of school, led him along the path of becoming a lifelong entrepreneur. One of his first jobs was peddling papers, books, tobacco, and candy to passengers at a railway stop in Indianapolis. And to break the ice, one of his uh, techniques was to wear an apron, which he would flip up and underneath it was a picture of a completely naked woman. <laughs> and this, of course, uh, you know, certainly helped convince customers to buy things from him. And it was here that he really learned that he had a tremendous gift for sales. <laughs> While working on the railroad, um, he developed a, um, a lifelong interest um, in reading and learning. And despite his vision problems, which were uh, corrected when he was a little older with corrective glasses. Um, he really um, had an absolute passion for the books of Robert Ingersoll. And Robert Ingersoll was a noted American politician of the time. Um, he was a narrator, a lecturer in free thought, agnosticism, abolitionism, and women's rights. And when Carl and Jane moved to their first house in Miami, Carl Fisher had 12 volumes of Robert Ingersoll's works bound in maroon leather and stamped with gold lettering to add to his library. Now, it was 1891 and Carl was 17 years old and he'd managed to save enough money from his job on the railroad, followed by working in a bookstore and then a bank to open a bicycle repair shop with his two brothers, Rowley and um, Earl. Now, the bicycle craze was in full bloom, and Carl was one of the first members of the Zigzag Cycling Club. And it was here that he met Jim Allison, a friend and future business partner in a number of enterprises that would help Carl ultimately make his fortune. At 19, he began racing bicycles professionally, and he was a natural athlete who could outrun anybody um, running backwards while those ran straight ahead. At the same time, his bicycle shop was a big success and it led Earl to um, convince a bicycle manufacturer, I can do this somehow, we hope, um, a man by the name of George Erland of uh, Cleveland, Ohio, to provide him with $50,000 worth of bicycles on credit. And that's around about $900,000 today, so he was obviously a very persuasive talker. And with very little money to promote his business, Carl used a number of stunts to sell bicycles. 
Um, he rode a bicycle over a tightrope, 12 stories above two buildings. He threw a bicycle off the top of a building and then said that the person who could bring the frame back to the bicycle shop would get a free bicycle. And he gave away prizes, he gave away more free bicycles just to induce sales. And the lessons he learned about promotion and the type of stunts that he enjoyed doing would become a hallmark throughout his business career. At the onset of the 20th century, the automobile was all the rage, and it led Carl to add a small garage at the back of the bicycle shop, which later led to the formation of the Fisher Automobile Company. And um, Carl also developed an interest in automobile racing, but his biggest opportunity was just around the corner when he found a solution to providing a light that would not blow out so cars could be driven at night. In 1904, he and Jim Allison bought a share in a company that manufactured acetylene for headlights, car headlights. And eventually, he and Allison purchased the whole company, renamed it Prestolite, and in 1910, sold to Union Carbide for $9 million. Now, Carl's share was over 5.6 million, which is just under 160 million today. But even prior to this sale, Carl and, um, and Allison were doing well, and in 1909, Carl ordered a boat, a 45-foot yacht, and upon delivery, Carl invited the man who delivered it to go on a cruise with him and another pal down the Mississippi River to Florida. The man was John H. Levy, who would become important as one of the founders of Miami Beach, two-time mayor of the city from 1937 to 1941. Now we now have to take a break from Carl's story to introduce Jane, but I want you to remember the boat because we're going to be coming back to it very soon. Jane Watts was a dewy-eyed 14-year-old, so it is said, when her heart was captured when she first set eyes on millionaire Carl Fisher as he sailed majestically across the skies of Indianapolis in a bright red helium balloon suspended um, with his white car underneath his automobile. She apparently then met him quite by accident at a party. They dated and married in 1909 when she was just 15. And she was born in 1885. Now, would somebody like to do the math? She was actually 24, but apparently vanity and telling a good story uh, led her to be somewhat economical with the truth in this instance. And I think we know of a number of ladies, possibly me included, who wouldn't mind knocking a couple of years off their age if they possibly could. Um, she was, in actuality, a social climber, and Carl Fisher was certainly the most eligible bachelor in town. And Jane and her friends were probably his number one fans. Um, they'd hang around, hoping for a glimpse of him in his car. Um, they'd go and sort of stand near um, the, the bicycle shop and the, and the, uh, the, um, the car showroom, hoping again that they might see him. And it's certainly true that she did indeed see him flying high over the city in his white Oldsmobile. Um, one of his numerous promotional stunts, and she did indeed meet him a little later at the Canoe Club, um, which gave a large party that she attended with her mother and father and her younger brother, Roy. Uh, but she wasn't 14 when she met him. Now, although that first uh, meeting at the Canoe Club didn't actually lead to anything very much, Carl Fisher certainly did notice her. And uh, the second time she met him, uh, she made certain that he noticed her even more. Apparently she had um, a cold, and so her parents had gone out leaving her at home, and somehow or another the house caught fire. And so the first person that she calls for help is Carl Fisher. And he rushes to her side, and from then on uh, she became swept up in his world. And this was a world of speed, glamour, money, and luxury that continued for many years. It was June in 1909, and they went for long drives in the country, 
and he bought her those beautiful long scarves that women used to wear in the early cars. And their courting song was in my merry Oldsmobile. Now, I'm not going to talk much more about Carl Fisher's many achievements before he um, arrived in Miami Beach, but I am going to say that he built the first paved highway in America, the Lincoln Highway from New York to San Francisco, and later the Dixie Highway from Indianapolis to Miami. And he built the Indianapolis Speed Track, which was completed just after their marriage, where the Indy 500 is raced to this day, and he was never happier than when building things and making the dirt fly, as he liked to say. But let's concentrate now on continuing the story of Carl and Jane and how they ended up in Miami. Carl was in a rush. He was always in a rush about everything. I've got to cut out this courting business. I've got to get back to work. Now, if we marry now, you can come on a trip with me to Los Angeles. I'm tired of traveling alone. So this brusque, charismatic man of 35 was finally going to settle down with his wench, as he referred to Jane. And in fact, his most uh, loving sentiment towards Jane was, I wouldn't trade you for two skunks. Not exactly hearts and flowers, when four months later, on October the 23rd, 1909, they were married. The small wedding was held at Jane's parents' home, which was on North Capitol Avenue in Indianapolis, and the house was full of flowers. Carl Fisher had had delivered truckloads of flowers, along with three bridal bouquets for Jane to choose from. And Carl Fisher arrived, he was nervous, he was disheveled, and he had with him his mother, Ida Fisher, and uh, also um, his manservant, William Galloway. Then uh, there was Minister, Jane's parents, and Jane's brother, and that made up the rest of the wedding party. Jane herself wore a form-fitting cutaway coat of diagonal blue and black stripe with a matching dress, um, which was trimmed in gold braid, and a matching hat. And impatiently, Carl shoved the wedding ring at him, spiring heavily and saying, good God, we must be married by now. <laughs> And finally, the wedding ceremony was complete and the couple left for Chicago and onward to California by train. As soon as the carriage door closed, Carl Fisher took a small knife out of his pocket and began ripping away at the braid on her dress until every inch of it had been removed. I don't like gold braid. This is how I like my women, unadorned, the way God made them. Now, he then thrust a lady's home journal into her hand, said, I've got to go and see a man about a boat, and he was gone. <laughs> and it was then that Jane learned firsthand that she married a man's man when business, big money, and big deals would always come first. Her next shock was returning from this first whirlwind trip, mostly spent with Carl's brother, Earl, while Carl attended business meetings. So she entered Carl's bachelor apartment where she would be living on Capitol Avenue in Indianapolis. And it was certainly a man's cave. His leather pillows were embroidered with the words, a woman is only a woman, but a good cigar is a smoke. <laughs> An enormous glittering glass-fronted player piano stood in the middle of the living room, the sort that would have been at home in any saloon of the time period. And this was a gift to, um, to Jane. Um, in the bedroom were two cheap prints of his lifelong heroes, Abraham Lincoln and Napoleon. And these two pictures were in every house that Carl Fisher ever owned. Either side of the bed, there was a stand holding salted peanuts on the one side, and on the other, a spittoon. And in all their years of married life, Jane could never get Carl out of the habit of using spittoons. Piles of wedding presents awaited, and on opening one, she found it was from a woman declaring undying love and promising eternal passion. Now, she'd seen this girl once before when alarm bells had sounded, and now would read about her again and again in the newspaper story that rocked the nation with the scandal of the decade. 
Gertrude Hasler, a church and opera singer, had been going out with Carl Fisher for six years with his repeated promises of marriage, love, and devotion. And she found out she'd been jilted when she read of his marriage to Jane in the newspaper. And she was devastated and humiliated. And she probably not only wanted justice, but she wanted revenge. And, and a share, of course, in Carl's good fortune. So Carl paid her $5,000 up front and then started paying her $1,000 a month until her demands just became too much for Jane and Jane insisted that this must stop. So Gertrude Hassler um, then hit Carl Fisher with a $500,000 breach of promise lawsuit and eventually the case was settled for a fraction of that sum. It was settled for uh, $25,000. And Gertrude Hasler went out and her very first purchase was a roadster automobile. She uh, had hundreds of marriage proposals from uh, men wishing to be happy to mend her broken heart. And she ultimately actually married in 1915 a man by the name of Frederick Carpenter who was a Chicago businessman. And she asked for and received a legal contract for, from him prior to marriage which I think was probably one of the first prenuptial agreements. So now we come full circle back to John Levi, Levi sorry, Levy, um, delivering Carl Fisher's first boat. Now, while listening to the men discussing their proposed trip down the Mississippi to Florida, Jane began to realize that she was not included. Now, Carl had told her that this boat was going to be for their honeymoon, and she was going to make damn sure that she was going to be coming along. What Carl didn't want her there because he thought this was going to be a boy's trip. Um, but eventually he relented and she joined Carl, um, his friend Harry Bushman, um, William Galloway, and Carl's servant, and John um, Levy. And they started going down to New Orleans. And they arrived um, in, in New Orleans in time to celebrate Christmas. And on Christmas Eve, um, Carl and his friend left Jane and William Galloway to trim a small tree on the boat while they went into town to explore. Well, they ended up spending the whole night in the pleasure palaces of New Orleans, um, finally returning in the early morning, carrying a small roast pig as a peace offering for Jane, which they had also used as a football on the way back, so it wasn't really in terribly good shape. I'm sharing this story to sort of try and highlight the kind of man that Jane Fisher had married. Now, after the boat left New Orleans heading for Florida, um, it got caught in a storm, and that caused some damage to the boat and really ended the trip. And Carl and Jane decided to go on to Jacksonville, and they left the boat in the capable hands of John um, Levy to get it repaired. And it was agreed that he would then bring the boat to Jacksonville and they would, you know, commence um, the rest of their trip. And uh, Levy got the yacht fixed, and he ended up sailing the boat until he reached Biscayne Bay. And this, of course, is where he sent Carl a wire that really changed everybody's life forever. The wire read, arrived safely. Miami, a pretty little town. Why not meet here instead of Jacksonville? Well, Carl and Jane came to Miami by train in February of 1910. And although the Fishers only stayed one week during this trip, it was enough time for them both to fall in love, not only with the climate, but also with the scenery. Upon returning to Capitol Avenue, Jane started entertaining in the homes and on the boats that Carl Fisher was building. The one boat turned into a small fleet of yachts. Houses started to be built. Um, Blossom Heath on Cold Spring Road, which was 12 miles from Indianapolis, which they made their main home. One at St. Joseph in Michigan. Um, one more in Detroit on the river, so that Carl Fisher could watch the boats. And then a house uh, in Miami, which had been the home of uh, um, a maker of herbal medicines, a man by the name of Alonzo Q. Bliss, which stood at the corner of Brickell Avenue and what is now Southeast 13th Street. 
And altogether, Carl was either building or buying, there were six homes in five years, all built at breathneck speed, making the dirt fly, and all furnished by Jane with large, comfortable furniture, and of course, spittoons. <laughs> And so began the social world, which would continue in Indianapolis, Miami, and then afterwards Miami Beach for all their married life. Dinners, parties, picnics, breakfasts, rarely did they dine alone. Once they entertained um, the entire regiment of French Blue Devils, the elite mountain infantry trained to operate in mountainous terrain and in urban warfare and every uniform guest departed carrying a magnum of the finest vintage champagne. Carl and Jane came back to Miami every winter following their first visit to the Magic City, and it was Jane who came up with the name The Shadows for the large square white mansion on Biscayne Bay, and Carl liked it so much, he later used the name again for their home on Miami Beach and all of his later yachts. And Jane really enjoyed the winter scene in Miami. She would dress up, she'd attend parties, luncheons, teas, she'd play tennis, all with the winter crowd um, who were at um, Henry Flagler's Royal Palm Hotel. And then she also had friends at the Halcyon. And Carl enjoyed all the fishing and all the boating he wanted. And having sold Prestolite, he was promising that he would take things easy. He was 37 years old. From the windows of the house looking across Biscayne Bay could be seen a narrow strip of a peninsula matted with mangrove and palmetto. A pearly white beach edged the peninsula and it was referred to locally as the beach and a launch made the round trip every day and it was a place to swim and picnic. But Jane did not like the biting mosquitoes which were so thick they swarmed black upon anyone brave enough to stray from the sand. Entering the only jungle in North America, as it was known, there were the rustle of spider crabs, alligators, large snakes. <laughs> One day, while out in the boat exploring Biscayne Bay, Carl with Jane and John Levy took a dinghy into Indian Creek. And as they approached a clearing, they noticed a very well-dressed elderly man who was short of stature with a dazzling white beard. This was John Stiles Collins, a Quaker horticulturalist who had bought land from the government at 75 cents an acre and was growing avocados. John Collins had already built a canal to ship his produce across the bay and was now busy trying to build a bridge. And Carl Fisher was impressed with Collins' courage and with his brave dreams. Collins had single-handedly started the bridge all by himself using wooden planks, and Carl saw the bridge dretting, jutting out from the bay's edge, graying in the sun. It was known locally as Collins' Folly, and now Collins was 75 years old, he had run out of money, his bridge was unfinished, his avocados were rotting on the trees, and Carl Fisher thought him the bravest man he had ever met. And so Carl loaned John Collins $50,000 to finish his bridge, and it was the first business investment that he made in Florida. And in return, he received bonds for the bridge and a strip of land 1,800 feet wide, running across the heart of the Jungle Peninsula from Biscayne Bay to the Atlantic. He added to this another 260 acres of land, and his new dream to build a city started to be born. Excitedly, he took Jane to show her his idea. She was horrified. Not only was this swamp filled with every conceivable creature, it was hot, it was steamy, and it was ugly. But she watched as her husband poured millions into clearing, dredging, and creating an island paradise. Now, there's not enough time for me to talk about how Carl Fisher um, transformed mangroves into magic. But by 1915, Carl Fisher's Lincoln Hotel was built on Lincoln Road across from his golf course. His Glaston tennis courts were completed, now the site of the Albion Hotel, and his polo fields were just down the road. Catering to wealthy white industrialists, socialites, celebrities, and the kind of nouveau riche that would build their summer homes and come for the season to party. 
and also completed two years previously in 1913 was the Shadows Miami Beach and Carl and Jane moved in surrounded by cranes, dredges, mules and hundreds of hard-working men creating Carl's dream city and this was their first home on Miami Beach at the end of Lincoln Road on the ocean where the decoupage is now sited. A beautiful house furnished by Jane with sea green carpets and large sofas and chairs covered in pale green cotton damask and a curved twin staircase and large high ceiling rooms with large fireplaces big enough to walk into. The final touches were the spittoons, one for the drawing room and one by the bed as before. And Jane always had to be prepared for guests and at this time, with the construction still going on around her, canned food had to be ordered in great quantity by mail order, and everything they ate, drank, or needed had to be transported in by wagon, barge, or truck across Biscayne Bay. And among the daily domestic duties was the constant warfare against insects, land crabs, and snakes that were retreating from the ever-advancing dredges, filling in their marsh retreats. Miami Beach was incorporated as a city in 1915, and Jane was there at the inauguration ceremony with the first mayor, Newt Lummis, and she considered it a birthday present just for her. Now, one of the problems that people from the North had while they were here for the season was missing the snow and the sleigh bells and everything that the Yuletide season would be back at home. And Jane solved this in the shadows where Carl had installed a glassed-in tennis court as an annex to the house. And here she had pine branches lining the interior and a large pine tree installed in the center of the court, topped with a glistening star. And Jane and her friends sewed, sewed red socks and filled them with toys and with candy. And that Christmas Eve, it was a velvet, star-studded night outside, while inside artificial snow drifted down as Christmas carols were sung. And Santa Claus held gifts for everyone in his huge sack. And there were refreshments and barrels of fresh orange juice and candy for the children. And it would be the first of many legendary Christmas Eve carol parties that Jane would host for her pioneer friends through the years. In 1919, Carr started a large publicity campaign to promote Miami Beach as America's greatest winter playground. And Jane took a trip to Europe alone. Now she'd made one brief visit with Carl in the summer of 1914, only to be forced to return immediately when World War I was declared. On this trip, however, from Venice, Jane shipped Carl a gift a red, black, and gold gondola, complete with fringed pillows and a gondolier costume. And Carl was thrilled. And he immediately had replicas of the gondola built, painted gold and bright red, to drift through the canal and the lagoons of Miami Beach. Miami Beach was theater. Slogans helped sell it as a paradise for the sports lover, a playland for youth, a haven of peace and beauty for the aged. It's always June in Miami Beach, where summer spends the winter. Unwittingly, Jane was the original of the Miami Beach bathing beauty. Now, Carl had built his casino, which is now where the W Hotel stands, and it had pavilions for pleasure, sunbathing, and swimming. Now, the first women going to the beach swam in long black stockings, long bathing suits like dresses, and bathing shoes. But Jane had learned the Australian crawl, and she found this attire far too restrictive. So she wore a form-fitting bathing suit with a shockingly short skirt that came only to her knees and anklets instead of stockings, and it caused a scandal. But Carl was impressed. He said, honey, that's the first sensible bathing suit I've seen. You hold your head up high and keep right on wearing it. And my goodness, I think you've started something. I've been trying for months to 
think up an idea to advertise the beach nationally. And what we're going to do is we'll get the prettiest girls we can find, put them in the shortest bathing suits with no stockings, and we'll send their pictures all over the country as the bathing beauties of Miami Beach. And thus, thanks to Jane Fisher, Cheesecake was born. <laughs> In the early days of Miami Beach, there were no theatres, cafes, or clubs, and everyone gathered at the shadows. And although Carl loved to have the house full of people, he would often stay upstairs with a book, or, um, you know, retire with two of his friends to the grassy closed porch to sort of smoke and, and tell stories. Entertaining was Jane's responsibility, and she embraced it with enthusiasm. On December the 31st, 1920, Carl's Fisher um, luxurious hotel Flamingo opened. Note the gondolas, please, thank you. And one of the first guests was President-elect Warren Harding with his wife Florence. And President Harding had lunch with Senator Cummings, who was staying at the Lincoln Hotel. But Harding stayed at the Flamingo. And Jane was publicly criticized by Warren Harding's wife, Florence Harding, um, because she was apparently telling off-color jokes to, uh, to her husband. She was not amused by that. Um, just as, as an aside, um, Florence Harding was a very interesting woman. She was five years um, older than Warren Harding, and um, she was called the Duchess. She apparently gave wonderful parties in the White House and um, was the first woman to um, own a camera, operate um, a movie camera, and to invite um, movie stars to the White House. Very first one who did that. Just thought I'd share that with you. The early 1920s saw families of great fortunes buy large estates and build their winter palaces by the sea. Julius Fleischmann, the bon vivant sailor and sportsman, president of Fleischmann's Yeast. Harvey Firestone, founder of Firestone Tire and Rubber. Eddie Rickenbacker, automobile racing's contribution to Allied aviation during World War I and World War II. And Bernard F. Gimbel, president of Gimbel's department store, and many, many more. Jane Fisher was now the leader of the millionaire community and the queen of Miami Beach seeing the population grow from 644 in 1920 to a winter population of 30,000 by 1925. And unforgettable evenings were spent at the shadows with entertainment by well-known singers of the day and the pipe organ which stood underneath the twin staircases being played. And many guests in our household names in Miami Beach, I've already mentioned Harvey Firestone, then there was Lagorce, DuPont, even Will Rogers, and John Levy. And there were elaborate parties with music and dancing. And Paul Whiteman's orchestra, the most popular <coughs> dance band in the 1920s and early 30s, often referred to as the king of jazz. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of um, a, a, a tune called Whispering. And then there was Valencia, three o'clock in the morning, in a little Spanish town. And when they came to town, she gave a series of parties for them and excited considerable comment with her expensive party favors. There were sterling silver wristwatches for all the members of the orchestra and a gold wristwatch for Whiteman himself. This was the era of sailing, deep sea fishing, swimming, tennis, and of course, polo, the favorite sport of the wealthy and elite they poured in for the season, always ending up at buffet supper parties at the shadows. When the uh, polo team of the Cuban army arrived with a gift of an Arabian horse for Jane from the president of Cuba, the Shadows hosted a Havana beach party. Copper and bronze fighting cocks strutted on the patio. Cuban music throbbed through the house and garden. Pits were dug. Whole hogs were roasted on spits with yams and corn baked in the ashes. 350 guests sat down to supper in the dining room. And during an interval, a well-known American baritone opera singer by the name of Reinhard Werenrath sang arias under the stars. And Jane could now travel. She could go to Europe. She could buy the latest Parisian fashions any time she chose. She could explore the Orient, Egypt, go anywhere in the world. 
She had her own personal maid, a social secretary, her own car, speedboat, yacht, and stables. She had everything but jewels. The one thing Carl never bought her because uh, he liked his women unadorned and also because of his fear of thieves. And the other thing she didn't have was a child. It was the summer of 1921 that Jane realized that finally, after 12 years of marriage, she was pregnant. And returning in November to Indianapolis and their home in Blossom Heath to await the baby's arrival, Jane suffered four days of labor and ultimately a cesarean. She gave birth on November the 13th to a little boy, Carl Jr. And for almost a month, she and Carl Fisher had everything. 26 days later, the baby was dead. <laughs> of pyloric stenosis, it's a rare condition that blocks food from entering the small intestine. And basically, the baby literally starved to death. To say the couple was devastated is an understatement. Carl vowed that he would never allow Jane to have another child. He'd watched her agony during the delivery and, of course, the aftermath. Jane wasn't in agreement with this, but by Christmas, they were both back in Miami Beach preparing for the festivities as before. And that winter also saw Jane become a columnist for the fledgling Miami Beach Daily Tribune. And for four years, her column appeared until the paper's final issue. By now, Carl was drinking heavily. The couple were growing further and further apart. But Jane still pursued her dream of a child. And, um, sorry, I missed that one out. See, I'm not used to doing this. Hopefully, sometimes this is their home. And um, so, there we go, we're back in Miami Beach now. Um, in December 1922, she adopted a two-year-old little boy called Jackie. And although Carl could never in his heart replace the memory of his lost son, there were, were occasions when there was happiness with the shadows. But the 20s were roaring past. A new, faster-living, hard-drinking crowd was replacing the gentle industrial giants of before. The gold diggers, the sugar daddies, the gigolos, the playboys, the gilded heiresses, and the gentlemen who preferred blondes. Miami Beach was the playground of millionaires and the happy hunting ground of predatory women. Is that why we're all here, right? <laughs> Night clubbing became the social outlet. Broadway arrived. Actors, vaudevillians, singers, dancers, orchestras, bands, cabaret artists, and the gamblers. Hard riding, hard drinking, overly rich. A rudderless crowd, which made the shadows a continuous round of parties and revelry. Gangsters bought large mansions, and an air of unease settled over the city and the days of being content with lemonade and sandwiches while singing old songs under a velvet night sky had vanished forever. By 1925 in Miami Beach, every hotel was crowded, every jerry-built house was sold. People slept in the streets and under the palms. It was like the California gold rush of 1849, as land speculators had caused a boom throughout Florida, glutting the land market as Carl and Jane watched his dream city being swept along on a tide of inflation. And it would take too long to discuss how Carl defeated the speculators and closed the market. Um, but by the end of 1925, he and, uh, and, and others had done so. And Carl Fisher had left Miami Beach to continue working on his latest project in Montauk. Their marriage was continuing to deteriorate, and Jane, feeling abandoned, instead of going with him, traveled once again to Europe and took a villa near Paris with her son, Jackie. Selling a piece of land she owned in Miami Beach for $86,000, she had the money wired to her and spent it all in one afternoon on jewelry. $86,000 is the equivalent today of $1,249,000. Carl, as we know, disliked jewelry, but she was absolutely determined that she was going to have some, and she now bought a number of very expensive items, including a large, solitaire, substantial number of carat diamond ring, a, a beautifully matched pearls, and a diamond and sapphire bracelet. 
A black male scare devised by her chauffeur in Paris saw Jane, with Carl's help, return to him in early 1926. And by May, Montauk was well underway. Homes had been started, miles of roads were being built along with electric light plants, water mains, and 800 men were working flat out every day to create Carl's new dream of yet another city. The Montauk Manor Hotel had been built, and the first home that Carl Fisher built was given um, by Carl to his old friend George Erland, the man who all those years ago had trusted Carl and given him a start with $50,000 worth of bicycles on credit. Now Jane did not share Carl's passion for Montauk, and she went to the new home, which is the picture you're looking at now, uh, it went up for market, up, up for sale recently, which is why that's the best looking photo of the bunch. Um, so she went to the new home he built there and pleaded with him to take a year off, six months at the very least, so they could be together. But Carl was drinking too much and he was too distracted with making the dirt fly to listen. And he was never going to change. So she returned to a hotel in New York and the following day she received word that Carl was returning to Miami Beach and she should move into the Montauk house. And she had only just finished unpacking when a letter arrived from Carl in Miami Beach and he told her that earlier that year, in March, he had sold his seaside holdings from 15th Street to 20th Street to an NBT Roni for two and a half million dollars. Roni would build on that land the million dollar Roni Palace. Carl and Jane's house, The Shadows, had been included in the deal. The beautiful home, the beautiful life, and the marriage were over. Carl and Jane divorced in 1926, but they remained lifelong friends, and he built homes for her and homes for himself, both in Miami Beach and elsewhere. And Jane married three more times, but she could never find the excitement she had with Carl. And Carl also married again, lost his, for, lost his fortune with contributing factors being the 1926 hurricane here in Miami Beach, followed by the stock market crash of 1929. And he died penniless in a Miami Beach hospital on the 15th of July, 1939. He was 65 years old. Now, after his death, Jane continued to live during the season in Miami Beach, and she reclaimed her rightful place as the widow of Carl Fisher. And she was still giving elaborate parties in the 1950s, and was there to watch while the shadows, her beautiful home, was demolished in 1961, and again was present to watch the demolition of the Roni Palace in the summer of 1968. During the last years of her life, she lived in somewhat reduced circumstances, suffered several heart attacks, but she told her friends she wouldn't change a thing. Honey, she said, I've had it all. That's it. Structures, but unfortunately, um, it doesn't. It doesn't work. And um, you know, you, you can have your home designated if you choose to, um, but a lot of people don't. Um, so, because obviously, a lot of developers want to tear down 
some of these old beautiful homes that we have here in Miami Beach and put on these new white dazzling concrete structures. Yeah. <laughs> as you researched this, what were the biggest surprises for you as you researched her life? I think the parties she gave, yeah. um, because she did, she really did give some marvelous parties. And she gave one um, which was absolutely legendary at the, um, <coughs> at the what was the, um, they started it calling it the Miami Beach Club, which was still Carl Fisher's Casino. And um, she had, you know, all this bougainvillea and all these beautiful flowers um, brought in from her garden at the shadows. And then also um, there were sort of um, stuffed birds and, you know, it was just like a, a sort of paradise thing. And she also gave um, beautiful um, uh, ones where everybody wore fancy dress and, uh, you know, she, she was <coughs> loved giving parties. I'm with her on that. I like giving parties too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what happened with uh, Jane Fisher's uh, adopted son? Do you know, I wish I knew that. Um, I presume he grew, he grew up, I mean, Carl Fisher had very little to do with him at all. Uh, Carl Fisher just never got over losing his own child and, and because of the terrible way, you know, that it happened. Um, but I, I tried to find out what had happened, but again, unfortunately, because so many sites in America were blocked in the UK, mm -hmm. and I did go through the newspaper files, but I just couldn't find anything, unfortunately. I wish I could. If I do, I'll let you know. <laughs> What were your source materials? Are they collected in a series of libraries? Or? There are source materials. In fact, the, um, the um, History Miami has all of Jane Fisher's archives. Uh -huh. And I did uh, reach out to them. Unfortunately, I had no response. Um, I was hoping to get some, you know, some, some good photographs. Um, so all my research, she did write a book called The Fabulous Hoosier. And I have a, um, I have a copy of that. So I used that. Um, she also gave a talk um, back in the 50s, I think it was. Um, and uh, that's available online, so I used that. Um, a lot of stuff, she did embroider things. I mean, she, you know, she liked to make a good story, so you have to sort of try and pick out bits and pieces and hope that what you're saying is the truth and not something that she's invented like she did about her age. You say. <laughs> and I did get online, I did find her um, marriage certificate, mm -hmm. but unfortunately I couldn't download it, I couldn't get a photograph of it, otherwise I would have put it up there. Oh, that's so, uh, just to prove that she worked out really was. Oh, everybody wants to ask questions. It's <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what the casino's policy Word, 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 word. Mm. Um, I don't, well, Carl Fisher, providing you had money, it didn't matter. Um, you know, it didn't matter um, whether, you know, what color your skin was or um, what your uh, religious beliefs were, um, if you had money. If you didn't, then that was a whole different thing because of the time period. So, um, the same as everybody else, I would think. But he so didn't... So, you know they allowed African Americans and Jews in Well, I know that uh, one of his very good friends was Jewish and belonged to um, his golf club um, because he had a lot of money. But I can't really, I can't really tell you. Um, he bought Fisher Island from the first black millionaire who was um, Dorsey. So, you know, he would deal with anybody if they had money. Mm -hmm. yeah. Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Don't ask me anything too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, uh, as, as, a sheer, as a she hero, what would you say she would be most proud of? I think, I think the, the city becoming a city mm -hmm. and the fact that she encouraged wherever she traveled, she would encourage anybody she met, if she thought them interesting and if they had enough money. Um, there was a wonderful man um, who called Prince Salim, who was a self-styled prince. He was actually, he was Sri Lankan, or uh, uh, from, um, of course it wasn't called Sri Lanka then, it was called Salon. And uh, he sold star sapphires and star rubies. And he self-styled himself, um, he was, I mean, he was born of good family. 
um, and he was over in Europe and he was selling to all these very wealthy people um, his star sapphires and, the, and his rubies and he met Jane Fisher and she encouraged him to come to Miami Beach as she did with anybody she met who she think, thought was interesting and would you know, help contribute to the beach. And he did come, in fact, he bought um, a number of properties on Alton Road. Um, he sold his star sapphires and his, um, and his star rubies. And Carl Fisher used to have a, a pocket full of these sapphires in his pocket. And he would give them oh, to no. people, just, you know, give them out to people. And, uh, and Jane Fisher um, had, um, Prince Sully had given her a really beautiful um, star sapphire and she was having it set into a ring and Carl Fisher said to her what's happened to that sapphire that Prince Sully gave you and she said I'm having it baby to ring and he said oh no give that to me he said I want to give it to one of my friend's wives because she's done this and that for me oh. you know that kind of thing so she did encourage wealthy people to come here whoever she met wherever she met them um, so I presume, I think that's probably one contribution. And then, of course, just being the kind of social person she was, you know, she, she really was the center of, of the world for the wealthy people in, in the time period. Yes, I know, that's it. Sorry, we can't have any more questions. <laughs>